Good evening, everyone. Welcome you to our first service of the week, our Thursday night service. The order of service is printed for you in your service folder. Our opening hymn in just a moment is going to be hymn 221. A couple of things, the normal message notes and connect card are in your service folder. If you have any questions or would like more information or anything else, feel free to fill out the connect card, get that to me, or, or put it in the box there in the entryway after church. Also, our regular meditations, the week or the daily meditation, the daily devotion um, for the next quarter is available. It doesn't start till the end of August, but we get them early, so feel free to grab a copy and have it available for when we get to the end of August. A couple of quick announcements. Um, one for those of you who normally come Thursday nights. Next week, we will have church like normal. The plan right now, assuming that the weather cooperates, is that the closing service for VBS is going to be outside. Um, and that we'll have church like normal in here. People can come and get ready for the closing service uh, for VBS and just hang out outside. And then when church is done in here, if you're staying and or interested and want to stay for the closing service for VBS, just walk right out the door and get a, grab a spot to sit and hang out and enjoy the songs with the kids. So that's the plan. If the weather doesn't cooperate, we will still have church. It's just it might be a little crowded in that entryway as we rotate things over from church to the closing service. So either way, we'll make it work. But just so you know that we will be having Thursday night next week like normal. Again, thank you for taking the time to be here tonight. Again, our opening hymn is hymn 221. May God bless our time in his word. Please stand. We continue in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, today we are encouraged by the Father of light, who gives us every good and perfect gift. May he inspire us to think of those things that are true and long for those things that are good, that we may by his grace shine like stars in the universe. We ask this in the name of the risen and ascended Savior, Jesus Christ our Lord. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. 
Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We live now in His peace and rise each new day to serve Him. Please be seated. We'll continue now with our next hymn, hymn 285. This week we sing verses 1, 9, 11, and 12. This week, as we continue our walk through the Ten Commandments, we focus on the seventh, or excuse me, the eighth, and we read first from Colossians chapter 3, verses 9 to 11. St. Paul writes, Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator, here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. But Christ is all and is in all. This is the word of the Lord. Our second lesson for this week comes to us from the Gospel of St. Matthew, Matthew chapter 26, verses 57 to 68. Matthew writes, Those who had arrested Jesus, took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, 
Are you going to answer? What is this testimony these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. And they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Messiah. Who hit you? This is the gospel of our Lord. Having heard the word which brings faith, we now join in confessing that faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. It begins on page 5 in your service folder. Please stand. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. We'll continue with our next hymn, hymn 459, hymn 459.
Grace you peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. In the name of that Christ, who once again shines for us today as a light of both hope and salvation and a path forward. The one who is a lamp to our feet and a light on our path and also our light both now and for eternity. We're getting into the Eighth Commandment, which means we're getting into the home stretch on the Ten Commandments. That doesn't mean there isn't a lot to talk about yet. In, in some ways, 8, 9, and 10 are really the most practical, applicable, relevant for our day-to-day lives. Uh, Commandment 8 relatively simply reminds us that we shouldn't bear false witness. Now, why is that important? Well, because a good name is important. A good reputation is a blessing. In Proverbs, a good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. And it is, right? Ask the millionaire whose reputation is trashed if they'd rather be not a millionaire with their reputation restored and almost certainly, except for maybe the most jaded and cynical, most people are going to say, yeah, I I want my reputation back. It's extremely precious. Your name is extremely valuable. The picture in Ecclesiastes, better than a fine perfume, which in the ancient world was an extreme luxury. We take it for granted, right? You can go to the store and, and buy a stick of deodorant for a couple of bucks. You can get most perfumes for, you know, 10. The expensive stuff is 40, 50, or 100. In the ancient world, though, this was stuff only within reach of only the most wealthy. Extremely valuable. Extremely precious is a good name. And you know it, especially if it's ever been taken from you. If you've ever been lied about, if you've ever had people make stuff up about you, tell untruths about you, gossip unfairly about you, you know what kind of a big deal this is. The story isn't unique by any means. Sadly, it happens every year in virtually every school on the planet even the best of them. A little child, a little boy or girl, gets singled out. Gets singled out by those who are bigger or stronger or more charismatic or more popular. Gets singled out for whatever reason, and and the reasons are as varied as the colors in the rainbow. But for whatever reason, that child gets singled out. And for the next year or years, that child is on the receiving end of abuse, verbal, physical, routinely lied about, mocked, made fun of. And sometimes those children with a a loving family grow up and and they're okay. But even if they grow up and they're okay, it still leaves a mark. It can take a long time to process. It can carry over into relationships even as an adult. I was one of those kids. Most of my childhood grade school experience was at St. Paul's Lutheran 
in the western Wisconsin. Great family life at home. My parents are great. Most of the time, I got along with my brother and sister, although, you know, sometimes my brother and I would fight, but brothers always do. And my teachers, you know, I had good teachers. But I got singled out. And, and I'm not telling you this because I'm looking for pity. I, I'm okay. I am. I, I've spent a lot of time processing things out. I, I'm okay. But I know what it's like, and I'm sure other people do too. And my guess, a lot of people in this room know what it's like to be singled out, know what it's like to be lied about or to, and when that trust is breached, when that trauma happens, this is why the Eighth Commandment is so important. This is why not giving false testimony against your neighbor is so important. Because when we lie about one another, when we lie to one another, damage, deep, lasting pain and trauma can happen. Proverbs 6.19 says, False witnesses who pour out lies and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. I'm pulling this a little bit out of an extended context here. And in this particular section of Proverbs 6, there's a short listing. Um, it starts off by talking about different things that the Lord despises, the th things the Lord hates, and it lists off a bunch of those. And, and, and these are a couple of them. False witnesses who pour out lies. The, this is something that God does not like, hates. And the person who stirs up a conflict in the community, that's a separate thing, but it's interesting to me because they actually connect if you think about it, right? Because whether you're talking about a, a social group of kids or talking about a family or, or, or talking about a neighborhood, if somebody goes and starts spreading lies about somebody else, what's it going to do? Stir up conflict in the community. It's going to. And all the pain and heartache that comes with it. Colossians 3, 9. Do not lie to each other. Since you have taken off your old self with its practices, just don't do it. If you can't trust who you're talking to, are you going to be able to have a meaningful relationship with them? Not really. I mean... On a certain level, if you're a magnanimous type, you, you might be willing to, you know, say, yeah, they're fun enough to go out and have dinner with, but are you going to trust them with anything meaningful in your life, much less your heart? If you can't trust them, no. It's a damaging thing. It breaks relationships. It breaks down the ability to build relationships and community and friendships. Ephesians 4.25, Therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor for all members of one body. How important it is for the body of Christ, right? For us right here, right now. We have, I, I counted real quick here, about 28 people here tonight. And just even within this small group, it, it, there's old jokes. And, and you can sometimes pick your cultural background. I, I'm mostly German by heritage, and so I'll tell the German version. If you have five Germans in the room, how many opinions do you have? Six. We're never going to always have everybody in the room agree on everything, right? There's going to be different perspectives, of, different, perspectives different life experiences, but you can still build a body under Christ you can still build a device, excuse me, a, a diverse group of people who love one another, care for one another, take care of one another. You can do that under Christ. But if we're lying to each other or if somebody's lying or God forbid somebody in leadership like me is lying to you, <laughs> what does that do to community? Very quickly, it does this. And there's a whole lot of wreckage, right? A whole lot of trauma. A whole lot of pain. 
how important it is for the body to be honest. Even if we don't agree, even if we have to figure out a way to take diverse viewpoints and opinions and put them together, we need to be honest. We need to be honest with one another. Jesus takes this very seriously. He makes a direct link between lying and demonic speech. The language of the evil one. He's very, very blunt about this. In, in John 8, just in case there's anybody that you know out there somewhere in this world, in your life, in your community, who doesn't think, you know, white lies, these are harmless things. Not a big deal. What does Jesus have to say? You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar, the father of lies. Ooh. I said this last week for those of you who are here again tonight. And if you're here but weren't here last week, you may be hearing this for the first time, but one of the most cruel things human beings can do to one another is to rob one another. There was my hook last week into the seventh commandment. Rob one another or rob somebody of their dignity. Taking a person's dignity in other words, speaking false testimony against them, telling lies about them, mocking them, making fun of them, belittling them. It's a painful, painful thing. And if any of you have endured any of that ever in your life, I am so sorry. It stinks. It really does. And if anybody you know or if you yourself have ever experienced anything like that, I would understand why you would have a hard time maybe with somebody like me who says, you know, you, you're, you, know you, you expect to come to church and have the pastor say, well, yeah, God forgives you and you need to forgive each other. Well, hold on a second, pastor. What? What? Do you have any idea what this person did to me, said to me when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, when I was in college? Pick your, pick your setting. At work? I know. Truly, I know. But here's the thing. As one speaking from experience, at some point you've got to put the rock down. pain and the trauma, you got, you got to figure out a way to somehow at some point put it down. Otherwise, you're Marley from A Christmas Carol, dragging that lockbox on a chain with you through all eternity. Otherwise, you're a person with an anchor on their back their entire life. Or, or to put it a different way, if you're constantly looking back on past trauma, and again, I'm not minimizing it. Trust me, I get it. I do. If you're constantly looking back on past trauma, though, you're going to have a very hard time looking forward and living in the present. At some point, we've got to put it down. But how? That's where Christ comes in. He gets it, too. He understands why a person's name is so precious. And his name truly is precious too. Luther writes about the eighth, we should fear and love God that we do not tell lies about our neighbor, betray him and give him a bad name, but defend him, speak well of him and take his words and actions in the kindest possible way. So often as you see in the meanings of the commands with Luther, he'll, he'll tell you, okay, th don't do this, but do this. Yet we want to avoid this and we've talked a lot about that, but there's some cool positive things to see here. Again, I know I do this a lot, but I think it's important. I think it's important to visualize what could be in a good way. Imagine a family, 
or a community or a church where most everybody, don't even need to bat 100%, but most everybody is doing a relatively decent job of defending one another, speaking well of one another, and taking one another's words and action in the kindest possible way. That would be pretty awesome, wouldn't it? That would be the kind of place I'd want to be at or in or a member of. It's a cool way forward because we know how important a person's name is, their reputation is. And as I said, how, how do we move forward, especially if you had pain and trauma? Again, Jesus gives us a way forward, which is why his name is so very precious. Particularly for those who are wounded and who've had their reputations tarnished or even destroyed for people who've suffered emotional or verbal trauma or even worse jesus name is truly and can be truly a very precious thing for us because he gets it he understands he had his name drugged through the mud unfairly and, and he spent a lot of months and years having religious leaders badmouth him, mock him, trying to undercut him. And then it all comes to a head Monday, Thursday evening, late going into Good Friday when Jesus is standing before the high priest. Again, you know, the guy who's supposed to be the pastor of pastors in the Jewish world at that time. And they're fully intending on coming up with whatever they have to to get rid of this guy. They don't care if it means absolutely unfairly railroading him. We got to get rid of him. And if that means false testimony and other things, so be it. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death, but they did not find any, though. The many false witnesses came forward. <laughs> problem they were having a hard time coming up with anything they were having a hard time coming up with even making up you know cohesive stories to get him in trouble but they do and they eventually get some false witnesses who come up and, and and claim that jesus is going to destroy the temple and jesus stays quiet they're lying about him they're bearing false testimony against him and he stays quiet. Why? Why does he stay quiet? To borrow from creedal language, for us and for our salvation. That's why he stays quiet. That's why he endures the abuse that's why he allows people who are being bold-faced liars to get away with it. He allows them to get away with it so that you and I can be saved. So that we can be redeemed. So that we can know love. From the one who is the Son of Man. Jesus tells the high priest, you have said so, but I say to all of you from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The one who had angels at his command. The one who created the angels and the world in which his abusers and accusers lived he allows it all to happen so that you and I can know hope and forgiveness and redemption. He allows his name to be drugged through the mud that night so that our name can be written in the book of life. How do we put pain 
and trauma down? How do we leave the past behind? How do we move forward in hope? How can a person do that? Jesus has opened the way. He's blazed the way. He's won salvation for us. And in Christ, you have somebody who's never going to lie to you. You have in Christ somebody who's never going to tell lies about you. In Christ, you have somebody who takes our name, who takes your name with whatever baggage it has, and he lifts it up, he dusts it off, he cleans it up, and he stamps on it, child of God. That's you. No matter what others think of your name, your reputation, no matter what you think of your name or reputation, God in his grace and love through Jesus Christ stamps child of God, precious and dearly loved on you. The power of baptism, the power of being connected to Christ in faith is that you have a place. You have a home. You have a family. You have somewhere where you belong. One of the most horrible, painful parts of being one of those people who are singled out is that you feel completely and utterly alone. Well, in Christ, you are never, ever alone. You are a child at the table, you are a son and daughter of the king. You're a member of the household, always and dearly loved. God puts his name on you. Which is a big reason why that ancient 3,400-year-old blessing we still use. Because of what it really means for us. There are a lot of very cool new things out there. There really are. But there are some ancient things that are absolutely beautiful, and this is one of them. God, in this blessing to the Israelites, declares them to be his own. And every time we get to receive that blessing in a worship service, we get that beautiful, comforting truth placed on us too. We are reminded that God, through faith and connected to Christ, makes us, declares us his own, his people. The Lord bless you. You. You person out there, insert your name. I do this, I've, I've done this before, right? Instead of reading you, just drop your name in there. All the you's, put your name in. The Lord bless, just for the sake of illustration, don't put me in. The Lord bless, bless Brian and keep Brian. The Lord make his shit face shine on Brian and be gracious to Brian. The Lord turn his face to Brian and give Brian peace. Make it yours. This is God's blessing to you. And through it, God puts his name on you and blesses you. You're made a part of his family. Which is why the writer of the Hebrews is able to say, in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy, Jesus, and those who are made holy, us, are of the same family. You're not alone. You'll never be alone. You have someone who cares. You have someone in Christ who isn't going to lie to you. You have someone in Christ who isn't going to lie about you. You have someone who is simply in Christ. In Christ, you have someone who simply just loves you. And that's the honest truth from Jesus. And that's the Eighth Commandment through the eyes of Jesus. Let's pray. Please stand. Lord Jesus, 
you are kind. You are gracious. You are honest. You are truthful. And we rejoice that your proclamation to us, your declaration, is that you save us. You redeem us. You make us part. You've made us a part of your family. You've put your name on us. We're never alone. And we want to trust you. We want to hold on to you. We want to know peace and joy and comfort and the peace and joy and comfort that comes from you. Fill our hearts through your spirit with that peace and joy. Help us to know your love, your grace, your presence. Help us to find in you a person we can completely trust person who will always be by our side and faithful. And then, having given us that peace, help us as much as we're able to be that kind of a person to somebody else. Help us to reflect your presence, your faithfulness. Help us to reflect your compassion in another person's life. We ask that you would put people like that in the lives of those who are wounded, who are lost, who are hurting. We ask that you would put kind and compassionate people into the lives of those who feel alone and abandoned and betrayed. We ask that your gospel would work powerfully in them and through them. We ask that your church would be a blessing and a place where people can find safety We ask that this church would be a blessing to both the souls here today and to the community, that it would be a place of blessing and safety and security. We ask these things as we ask everything in your name, joining in the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This Sunday, we're going to be rejoicing um, in the installation of our new upper grade teacher, but that isn't until the 8 o'clock service, so we'll just fast forward right now down to the preface on the bottom of page 7 and begin with the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is to shepherd his flock till he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Please be seated. The Lord's table has been prepared. All members of our congregation, wider fellowship, or those who previously announced, please come forward for all things are now ready. Uh, by re we'll continue now on page 10 with the closing prayer and blessing. Please stand. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this Holy Supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now, may that blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon you today and always. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give to you his peace. Please be seated. We'll conclude our service today with our final hymn, hymn 458, hymn 458. Once again, good evening, everyone. God's blessings on your week. Announcements, usual places, up on the screen in your service folder online. If you're signed up for the Rocks game, remember, we'll be meeting there um, before the game to get everybody in. Um, you're probably going to be able to just walk right in with your ticket, I'm assuming. Just go find your seat and sit down. God willing, the weather, again, stays decent, and we'll be able to enjoy an evening with about 70 other Petra members there. So that'll be a fun night with the fireworks and hopefully a good game. Other than that, um, like I said, VBS starts this Sunday. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to catch me or Sue tonight, since she's here, and we'll do our best to answer them for you. Be well, be safe. Thank you for taking the time to be here, and Lord willing, we'll see you again really soon.